Hi everybody, welcome to my talk, How to Improve Your Reflective Essay and Academic Writing, aimed at student nurses. I hope the talk really helps anybody that's struggling with their assignments. Do check out my other videos on my YouTube channel too. So within the talk, I'm going to go through how to plan ahead and structure a reflective essay, choosing the right topic and themes for analysis, discuss how to avoid mistakes that lose you marks, how to write less descriptively and increase your critical analysis, and importantly, learning from markers feedback to improve your academic writing in the future. Planning ahead and structuring your assignment is one of the most important ways that you can increase and improve your academic writing because you're going to have more time to spend on your assignment. Another key area is to keep the assignment brief and understand the meaning of key words that are in the assignment brief. What is the module lead actually asking you to do? And if you go off on a tangent and don't um, adhere to the assignment brief and what's been set, you potentially are going to lose marks and fail the assignment even. Always ask the seminar or the module lead if you are unsure and they should help focus your ideas or topics and let you know if you've gone off brief. And that's a really good thing to do in the first week or two of term with all your module leads to check that you know exactly what, what, what's been set. Also, what's helpful is to review the assessment criteria on the marking grid and what, what the module lead is using to mark your assignment. Have you, um, having your assignment guidance next to you while you're studying, and it might be in a plastic wallet, um, is helpful when you get into your assignment and you're analysing literature and, and you're starting to go off a ta on a tangent potentially, just to have it there to, to get it, steer you back on track and just to make sure that you're um, adhering to the brief and having it there is really, really helpful. Working back from the hand in dates for all your assignments, because you're going to have um, skills exams to revise for, you, you might have a poster presentation, you might have two or three essays that semester. So it's important to get your calendars, to put your hand in dates down so you know exactly when assignments are due. And then it's helpful to work backwards and to through the semester so that you can start to um, break the assignment and revision down into sections over a full semester to complete. So you essentially you've got lots of short term goals to complete, writing a plan and assigning dates in your calendar to work on your different assignments, getting in a study routines helpful as well, switching off social media to reduce interruptions on those days that you've assigned to do some study work on a particular assignment. Planning ahead and structuring your assignment. So I've done an example here and um, you don't have to adhere to this. This is just a, an example. You were given a reflective essay to hand in week 12 of semester. So what you can do is week one or three is decide on an appropriate event and experience that you're going to write about as for your description and write your introduction and your description for your assignment in those one to three weeks. You can change it later slightly, but ask your tutor then to check that that, that description, that focus is OK for your assignment. If you're not quite sure, you, you might be, but that's if you're not, do ask the tutor. And doing it in the first one to three weeks, maybe not the first week because you're just getting used to being back in the semester, but within the first you know few weeks to just get started will motivate you with the rest of the assignment and it might be that, that that what you've chosen isn't right but you've done it and you've got some feedback and now you know what you're doing so that's going to motivate you and your description your feelings and evaluation is not with literature so there's no reason why you can't sit down just bash it out and just um, get it written 
Then in week three to six, review your literature, critically analyse, and you might focus on two or three key areas. Just put in note form. It's not written in, in proper narrative in, for an assignment, but you're writing your notes. You're comparing and contrasting literature relating to those key themes. You're identifying gaps in the literature and linking it to what went on in your reflection. And then in week six to eight, plan to write that main body. So you've already written the description, the feelings and the evaluation. And now you're going to write the analysis relating to that reflection. And I'll talk a bit about how some tips with that later. And then in week nine to 11, complete the conclusion and action plan, which will be much shorter. And and if you change deadlines and you can't quite meet weeks three to six, you might use that extra two weeks at the end because conclusion and action plans shouldn't take you two weeks or a day even. And the main body is what's going to take the time and the literature review. But you've got that extra two weeks at the end to sort of um, change your deadlines where needed. And these deadlines may change as well. So you be prepared for blips along the way. The calendar um, may need revising and you're all human and it takes time to find what works for you. I remember being a master's student and handing assignments in where I, I didn't spend enough time really preparing and writing because I was working full time and there was other things going on at the time. I didn't do that for all my assignments on my master's, but there may be times where, you know, you're quite close to the deadline, but where possible, if you can factor in and structure your time across the full semester, it just gives you more time to write your assignment, which will improve your academic writing. Requesting extensions earlier if you've got mitigating circumstances is helpful rather than later. Um, obviously, if you're ill later in the semester, you have to do that. But if you know, you know, I know a lot of students that um, when they're poorly at the beginning of semester, they might take two weeks off. They just think, oh, I won't bother putting the form in. Uh, you know, I'll get the assignment done when they they're you know, it's that they're allowed to have that extra time because they were poorly and then they'll ask later in the semester and then you're worrying whether it's going to be agreed or not. So much better to, the minute you know that you've been poorly and you've had two weeks off or a week off, let the um, your module lead know, get your mitigating form in and then you've got your extension there, whether you use it or not, it's it's there and it's, it's, um, well, it's helpful to use if you need it. Structuring a reflective essay. Um, now, I'm not going to go through all the different reflective tools and cycles that there are. I mean, Gibbs is, is one of the most popular, which I've got here, but your tutors will do that in, in um, university. Um, just a few, just going over Gibbs, which is one of the most popular. So when we're looking at description of an experience, the set of your experience, you're setting the context of what happened, you're reporting the detail with no interpretation in that description. Um, you're saying what happened, who was there, and you're giving facts. And you're using a past tense because it was in the past. What did people do? Why were you there? What was your involvement and what was the outcome? With feelings, what were the, your thoughts about the experience? So this is where you've got, um, you, you know, might have some emotions that you talk about how you felt, personalising the experience from your perspective. And you, you'll use words like I thought, I felt. Have you encountered this before? This reminds me of something from the past. How did others feel? How did you feel about the situation? How do you feel about the situation now? With the evaluation section, what was good? What was challenging about the experience? What worked or didn't work in the situation? And what did you and others do that worked or didn't work? And then you've got your critical analysis, which is the main body of the essay. And it's where you make sense of the situation. So um, you might target two or three key areas to analyse relating to your description and your reflective um, description, feelings and evaluation. So what does the literature say to support what 
you're saying why things happened in a certain way. So you're integrating the literature into the main body here in your analysis. What should have happened um, according to the literature? Are there gaps in the literature? And then that will lead to your conclusion. What did you learn? What could you have learned? What could you have done differently? What knowledge and skills do you need to develop if it happened again? And then your action plan. How would you deal with a similar situation in the future? What would you do differently? How would you act differently if it happened again? So I'm often asked, how do you structure reflective essays? And students get really struggle sometimes with fitting the reflective cycle, um, depending on what tool you use, into an assignment or essay format. So you might want to just use the reflective cycle headings for your assignment. So this, these are GIBs, so description, feelings, evaluation, analysis, conclusion and actions. But you need to remember that those headings do not have equal weighting in words. So if you write exactly the same amount of words for your description, feelings and evaluation, analysis, and then a shorter conclusion, for example, you're not going to get a lot of marks because your analysis should be your main body of your assignment. So do check out your module handbooks. Module leads often will help you with the words and start. Uh, and they might say, for example, description, feelings and, and evaluation is um, 200 to 300 words. You or 500, depending on how big your assignment is. The analysis is going to be 1500, 2000, um, 2500, and then the conclusion again would be shorter at 200 words, for example. Um, but if they don't, then you need to think about your weighting and just do make sure that your analysis is your main body. Usually essay format, you have your introduction, you have your main body and your conclusion. So fit a re the reflective stages, I've, I've got Gibbs's reflective stages here. I fitted them into an, a standard essay format. So you might start with an introduction. This is just an example, um, but you'd start with an introduction where you include the aim of the assignment and then you lead the marker through the structure of your essay, stating the key areas that are going to be analysed. And you're making it easier for the um, marker to mark your assignment because you're, you're clearly organising your essay in an es a good format, an organised way, which is when you look at your marking criteria, you usually have marks for organisation, for example, and meeting the um, assignment brief. You then might do your description, evaluation and feelings, which will be concise, factual, and it will lead to areas for analysis. And then you've got your main body, which is your critical analysis of two to three themes integrating literature that will lead to a conclusion and action plan. So you can see here I've got all the stages of Gibbs's reflective cycle in an essay format with introduction, main body, conclusion. And just so long as you're aware that the words should be much shorter for the description, evaluation, feelings, you have your main body as your critical analysis and then your conclusion would be shorter. That would be a really good structure to use for a reflective assignment. When you're looking at your introduction, you might start just some key tips. You might start with defining key terms. If it's if it's linked to a key topic area, for example, or you've got you've seen a really good quote to start the assignment off that you think's quite you know got some impact. Um, it's helpful to keep it. So while you're doing your literature review, have in mind that you've got to write your introduction, your main body, and your conclusion and action plan. And sometimes you, these quotes come out at you, and you think, "Wow, that's good. I'm going to use that as part of my introduction." Because you, you'll find it hard often when you've written the assignment. You're always going back to try and find that one quote. Often can be quite hard. So make sure you do it at the start. And and actually, it's quite helpful to to section off your assignment where. You, when you're doing your literature review, that you have a folder or you do it on the computer, that you write it there and then, or you print out an, an article where it's got this information on so you can look back later. 
So introduction, you might start with defining key terms. So an example here is person-centered care is defined as, and you've got your author and year, or you might say there are various leadership models and frameworks available if you were doing a leadership module um, assignment. Or you might want to start your intro introduction by summarizing the aims of your assignment and the assignment brief using the brief that's in front of you. As I said, you should have it there. So the purpose of this assignment is to critically reflect on, or you might start with the aim of this reflective essay is to, and then state what it is. And that's why it's really helpful to have that brief there in front of you when you write your introduction. This essay sets out to explore, critically analyze, or within this reflective essay, I will examine whichever area it is that will lead to a critical analysis and conclude with future actions to aid by future learning. So these, the, the, you can start your introduction however you wish, but it's, it's sometimes helpful to focus on that brief and to keep it quite factual because it saves you words. You don't need to write loads of description in an introduction. It should be, you know, get to the point, what's the aim, lead the reader through your assignment, and um, that really helps the marker see that you're organised. Description, feelings and evaluation section. Check the assignment guidance on suggested word allocation for this section or section it yourself, as I said, so you're weighting it less than your main body. Choose the right event and experience or situation to reflect upon. And if you don't choose the right experience, um, it can it can sometimes mean that you fail the assignment because you've not um, been able to reflect in the area that the module lead is really wanting you to focus on. So do make sure that the reflection you're using works for that assignment. Now, as a first year, that can be quite hard. Second, third year students can usually find that easier because they're used to writing assignments. But if ever you're unsure, depending on the essay that you're writing and the reflection that you're using, just check with your module lead. That's what they're there for. And or seminar lead. And because if because the get have you might have two or three in mind and it's helpful to chat that th through as well with your module lead and it'll help you choose which one would be easier maybe to analyze with the literature with the description and feelings and evaluation it's factual there's no literature usually it's concise you get to the point as you gain most of your marks in your analysis and your main body. But you do need to explain what went on and have enough detail um, that we can, the mark can see um, what happened in that situation. So structuring your main body of your assignment, it's really helpful to read um, article abstracts, first of all, to immerse yourself in the data and then you can start drilling down on key papers and make sure that you link to your librarians for support. It's all free and they're fantastic at narrowing down on key search terms. If you just look at the abstracts initially, it's helpful because when you have a reflection, it may be in a large topic area, so it could be to do with teamwork, but potentially you could go into four or five different areas of teamwork. And to get an in-depth analysis, you only need to choose two or three key themes to get some in-depth analysis. So on a page or two, once you, you know, sit there, go through the abstracts and start bullet pointing some of the data that's coming out. What is this uh, What is this paper looking at? What are the key themes in this paper um, to do with teamwork? And in the article then, the articles will give you a sense of the literature that's in that area that will start to narrow you down on two or three key themes. And then you can go back narrowing your search just in those two, three, two or three key areas rather than looking at everything to do with teamwork. So doing that bit of searching at the beginning on abstracts to get a feel for the area is important. And you may start the main sec this main section by explaining key definitions or terms, professional or government policies or law. It depends on what you're looking at. And doing that bit of abstract reading at the beginning 
um, you, you might come across a key paper. So make sure you document it then because it's quite hard to go back sometimes. You might um, read in an abstract and see this perfectly written definition or term and um, or literature review with a lot of the key papers that um, to do with that area subject. So try and do document as you go along and, and um, keep those papers in mind. Example themes for critical analysis. So I've just put some examples here. So self discharge or a patient or relatives complaining. So this this is just really to give examples that potentially if this happens to you and you want to reflect on it and, you, and your patient complained, you weren't quite sure what you did wanted what to do in that situation and your practice supervisor had gone to theatre and um, you were really um, stressed and didn't know what to do. So you might want to look at local national policy on discharge. You might want to look at escalation. You might want to look at de-escalation and the communication and what you should say to patients in that situation. You might want to look at the importance of a staff debrief and team support because your mental, your practice supervisor is gone and who do you go to? And what do we do when we have stressful situations? The patient liaison service for complaints um, and the procedure for complaints or a, another area, depending on your reflection. So that's why it's important to look at the um, abstracts of articles and get a feel for an area so that you can because you couldn't look at everything in that in that reflection. So it's easier to focus on two or three key areas. Another example might be health care assistant might um, might have incivility and they might be rude to you and say you know you should be washing with the patients with me and they might not understand your role that you're supernumerary and they've got a lack of knowledge of your role and they made you feel uncomfortable um, and and you could look at that in different ways so a lack of national standardization for support worker education so it might be that the support worker doesn't understand what your role is and it, it and for your learning in the future you might turn around and say to her look this is the role of a student nurse and i'll explain it to you and uh, but you didn't think at the time uh, because it was so busy but it might be something that you look at in the future for your learning it could be looking at positive teamwork and barriers to teamwork, which could be a lack of respect across teams. It could be looking at poor staffing or there could be another issue linked to why there was incivility with that healthcare assistant towards you. Um, so again, looking at the literature, you might choose a topic area depending on what literature you find overcoming a communication barrier and tools to promote communication or support patients or looking at a compassionate approach. You might look at um, speech and language therapy tools to overcome a barrier. It could be linked to a patient not having his hearing aid in and the pet, none of the staff were putting the hearing aid in, but you did and you needed to educate the staff. Um, if a patient has um, a, a sight impairment, um, it could be that uh, or a hearing impairment, sorry. Um, when you patients lip read, they need to see your lips. And if you're on a night shift, the light should be on your face, for example. You didn't realise that until you looked at the literature. It could be so many different areas to do with communication. So in your main body, in your critical analysis, you're integrating literature throughout that analysis. So um, to consistently to make sense of the situation of what happened, what should have happened, any gaps in the literature and your knowledge and skills. So you use literature throughout to back up points as much as possible and you refer to the situation event in your analysis. So it's not just having a talk about teamwork or um, incivility at work. You still you need to bring it back to your analysis. Um, within your paragraphs as well. So looking at integration of literature. So when you're integrating literature, you might if you're going to bring in a direct quote. So I've got one here for Johnston 2022. Put your page stated that and then you've got your direct quote. So you might integrate your literature into a paragraph like that. 
and then you can comment on what Ford Johnston said and how it has relevance to your critical analysis, to your reflection, sorry. All paper, another example, all paper-based nursing records are currently being moved over to digital electronic record systems across the UK. And then you've got a bracket where you've summarised you, that reference backs up what I've just said. So you can integrate the literature in, in by having direct quotes or summarising literature and having the literature at the end of the sentence. And do um, th th when you go to academic skill um, sessions in universities, they will help you with this. And often librarians, libraries have um, study skill sessions as well. So I've given you two ways of integrating literature as examples. But again, how does this relate to your reflection? So the second bullet point here to do with nursing records, it, your, if your reflection was about nursing records and um, uh, you know, a checklist approach used at the bedside, for example, um, when you were using electronic patient records with your um, practice supervisor, it, you would need to be referring back to your reflection. Nurse researchers have started to question how electronic patient records may conflict with patient-centred care and have attempted to address this issue using more patient-centred narratives. So again, this is another way of linking the literature where we've got two references linked um, um, to, to make a point and to talk about how nurse, what the research is saying in this area. But again, you need to link it to your reflection. So this would be a reflection perhaps on you going around with the EPR, with your mentor, you're doing your medication round and um, you're finding that your mentor is ignoring your patient when your patient's asking open questions and you went to the patient and you answered the patient, you came away from the electronic patient records and you might be wanting to reflect on the checklist approach and how the EPR might be causing a barrier to your communication, for example. You know, this is just a, a made up example. But here um, you can see that the integration of literature, I've given you some examples that, of, of how you would be integrating literature throughout your analysis depending on what you're looking at and it's just giving you examples of how to do that. So with your conclusion the summary of the points that you're making and um, will be in your conclusion you focus on bringing your assignment together so within this assignment um, and then you state what you covered and then you can move to what you learned, what might you might have done differently in the future. So your conclusion is going to be much shorter than all the other sections in your assignment. And also you might have your future actions in your reflective cycle. You remember you've got future actions might be presented before your conclusion and lead to a conclusion or within your conclusion. It depends on how it works and how your assignment flows. So some example narrative for conclusions, just to get you started. Um, having reviewed the current policy for patient discharge, so you're saying what you've reviewed and then you're going to summarise what you've um, concluded or following a critical analysis of communication strategies relating to de-escalation. You can go into those strategies. It's evident that there's a need to inform or to document or to assure patient safety on discharge or to have a clear audit trail of whatever it is. So you're sort of summarise, you're leading us from um, what you've done and what your concluding thoughts are. And then if you're going to look at the literature, you might say that, um, you know, because you're identifying if there's any gaps in the evidence base and what to do in the future. Example might be there's a lack of evidence in this area or research in this area or the evidence base is sparse. There's a need for further research in whatever area or, or um, uh, uh, for you to gain more insights and, and to develop your skills in an area. Um, it's paramount that a person centred, empathetic approach is required. In the future, I hope to increase my knowledge and skills in the area of whatever. So you sort of see how we've come to the conclusion and we're looking to the future. 
some simple ways to avoid losing marks. Keep to the word limit, um, check the word limits as you may lose five to 10% of marks more, it depends of what, of what the guidance is in your marking grid, which is helpful to look at, as I said at the beginning. Essays great, greatly under the word limit often lack depth. So if you go way under, say, 30% of the assignment you haven't completed, it will lack depth and analysis. So the markers will know. Adhere to referencing rules. So assess, access library supports and they often have little flyers on how to, to write references. Check referencing styles. The main thing usually is just to be consistent with your referencing. You might want to use reference management tools. So EndNote or Mendeley. Um, and th these are sort of digital tools where you Put, will put, key in your references, your, your citations as you go along and your reference list is written for you. I have used EndNote and I found it hard at first and I actually went to a librarian EndNote session and I had my laptop open and she was really helpful and I couldn't be without it now because I'm doing a PhD and for your dissertations I'd highly recommend using EndNote or Mendeley. Get your, once you get used to putting the citations in it just means you don't have to write a reference list again so it's fantastic the other thing would be to have some example references in front of you and then you can spend time checking your references so you've got an example article which I've got for you now actually to show you so a reference for a book for example so that's one of my books there um, and then this is using Harvard you've got an article reference in front of you and you're handwriting them and professional papers such as NICE, that's an example there. So try to avoid losing marks. Again, it's helpful to register if you've got any dyslexia or learning needs right at the start. And it means that you won't be penalised then um, for grammatical errors, for example. And to access support and ensure that the marker makes those reasonable adjustments for you. Using the wrong tenses, grammatical or spelling errors, if you do not have dyslexia. Um, so trying to get somebody to proofread, for example, so you're using the right tenses and you use, as I said earlier, you use past tense for the description. Um, so looking at uh, your tenses, your present versus your past tenses. So just get other people to proofread if you're not brilliant with your tenses. And um, also looking at first person and third person. So in a reflection, you use the word I. You may use third person later on, but if you know you don't have to, and, and it's easier just to use I in many cases. So an example of first person um, here. It, this is in the first person. During a busy late shift, a patient approached me and shouted that he was going home now and that he was not prepared to wait any longer for his medications. I felt anxious as I did not know what to do. I couldn't find the self-discharge procedure or self-discharge form and my practice supervisor was in theatre. So this is written now in the third person. During a busy late shift, a patient shouted that he wanted to go home now and he was not prepared to wait for his medications to arrive on the ward. There were no self-discharge forms available for the patient to sign and the practice supervisor was in theatres. But it feels very detached. So that's why I would always recommend in a reflective essay to use the word I. This is quite good though because it, this it shows an example of how to write in the third person um, because in other essays it might be um, that you know for example when you're writing your dissertation that it's easier to you know it's, it's good to write academically in the third person if you can in certain situations and it's a skill that you can learn and I remember a tutor when I started out literally sitting with my assignment showing me how to write in the third person it just clicked then so I've just done an example here as well for you to see but ideally reflective essays you write in the first person Another mistake that students make is not integrating literature into the narrative correctly. And I did show you some examples of 
a quote and literature at the end of sentences um, earlier in the slides. So do go to study skill sessions and library sessions. You don't want to lose marks because you haven't um, quoted a reference in the right way. Confidentiality, so no names of staff, roles or clinical settings as they may be identifiable and um, don't plagiarise and you'll have lots of advice in your module handbooks about that I'm sure. And finally, learn from markers feedback. I remember many times as a module lead where students wouldn't, when we didn't used to have them online, for example, where students wouldn't read their feedback and come and collect their assignments. And it's really helpful to read the feedback and learn to develop your academic writing so you don't make the same mistakes throughout your degree. And if you don't understand a comment in the marker's feedback, book to meet the marker or go to the module lead. And so you learn from that feedback. So I hope you found this talk helpful. Do put any comments in YouTube and I'll answer all the questions. Um, you can contact me on um, Twitter, DM me or on my website or on Instagram. Wish you every success with your future assignments and good luck with the rest of your degree.